Mr. Johnson waited for the two to sit down and catch their breath before asking. You must have encountered the haunt just now, right? Where's the other officer? Don't tell me he got snatched. Lieutenant Eric waved his hand, panting. He's fine. He's keeping watch at the clinic. We just came to rest a bit, but... He ran out of breath mid-sentence, unable to continue. Mr. Johnson immediately deduced. But halfway here you met the haunt, huh? And even helped it. Detective Kevin, having regained her composure first, answered Mr. Johnson. That's right. We met a real ghost. It pretended to be an old lady who fell by the pond. When Lieutenant Eric went to help her up, Mr. Johnson sighed loudly. I knew something would happen. Stay here tonight. Don't go anywhere. The creature will definitely call at the door later, impersonating your colleague, but don't open the door. After speaking, Mr. Johnson turned to pick up the photo from the floor only to find it missing. He asked Lieutenant Eric and Detective Kevin, Where's my photo? Lieutenant Eric blankly looked around. It's not under the door? Mr. Johnson shook his head, seeming slightly panicked. Of course it's not there. Don't tell me. Mr. Johnson shuddered, but immediately affirmed, It's bad. The haunt definitely took the photo. Now it's followed us back and will disturb us tonight. Knock, knock. Right after Mr. Johnson finished speaking, loud knocks sounded outside. He trembled, not daring to move. Lieutenant Eric hurriedly called towards the door. Who is it? A response immediately came from outside. It's me, Quentin the Village Militia Volunteer. I heard Mr. Johnson say county police came down, so I brought some food and drink over midnight to share and liven things up. Lieutenant Eric suddenly glared at Mr. Johnson. Didn't I say to keep our operation secret? Mr. Johnson scratched his head and ears. But Quentin's our militia. It's better if he knows to assist us. I only just called him after you left. If that's his voice answering normally, it can't be the haunt. Let me open the door for him. Mr. Johnson opened the door, intending to let Quentin in, but unexpectedly the figure behind the door wasn't Quentin at all. It was the old woman Lieutenant Eric and Detective Kevin had helped earlier. Mr. Johnson's eyes bulged. Before he could say anything, his face drained corpse white, and he collapsed. A terrified scream rang out in the night from Detective Kevin, who was horrified seeing the ghost's face appear. Lieutenant Eric suppressed his own fear and quickly dragged Mr. Johnson's body inside, slamming the door shut. Mr. Johnson had a dazed, lost expression, not uttering a word. Though still breathing, his complexion was deathly pale as if he were already dead. A few minutes later, Mr. Johnson's breaths grew fainter and fainter until wheezing weakly. Finally, his throat gurgled and he passed it away. Seeing her dad D, little Lily couldn't hold back her wails. Daddy. She threw herself on Mr. Johnson's corpse, shaking him and continuously calling him. Mrs. Sarah also collapsed outside, shrieking and weeping madly. Lieutenant Eric's eyes misted over as he too cried. Mr. Johnson had died due to his and Detective Kevin's mistakes. If only they had truly believed Mr. Johnson's words, perhaps he wouldn't have been fooled by the haunt impersonating Quentin. The next morning, news of Mr. Johnson's death by the haunt spread throughout Miller's Creek. The villagers weren't surprised by this at all, as such careless deaths from hounds snatching people weren't uncommon here. After assisting Mr. Johnson's funeral arrangements until evening, Dagen and Eric and Detective Kevin immediately went to the clinic to see Detective Ryan. Detective Ryan had dozed off next to the burnt girl, who was still alive but breathing very weakly. When Lieutenant Eric and Detective Kevin arrived, the ambulance dispatched from the county also pulled up. Lieutenant Eric supported the girl into the ambulance and shook Detective Ryan awake, asking, See anything strange last night? Having just woken up, Detective Ryan yawned groggily. Nothing strange at all. But why did neither of you come to switch shifts? You left me awake all night until I dared nap just now. Lieutenant Eric sighed. The village chief, Mr. Johnson, died, Ryan. Detective Ryan had been half-dreaming, but this doused him like a bucket of cold water, jolting him alert. 
what do you say? Mr. Yonson died. Detective Ryan rubbed his ease in disbelief. Detective Kevin, standing beside Lieutenant Eric, also affirmed, That's right, he died, and it was from the very thing we didn't believe in, the haunts. Detective Ryan seemed stunned into silence, thinking they were joking too far. But seeing Lieutenant Eric and Detective Kevin's grave expressions, he then had to believe it true. Lieutenant Eric asked again, while guarding the girl last night, learn any new info? Detective Ryan answered, one extremely important detail came out. She said the killer isn't from Willow Creek, but actually from Miller's Creek itself. From Miller's Creek? Lieutenant Eric contemplated, then seemed to realize something. He analyzed, if the killer's from Miller's Creek, the problem may be easier to solve now. Precisely because he's from here, he's always relied on the haunt legend as a cover. That's why, despite so many atrocities, he hasn't been caught, and he chooses Willow Creek victims to misdirect investigations. Detective Kevin suddenly said, if he really is from Miller's Creek, it'll be very simple. No villagers here are out at night. We just need to stake out all three village exits and monitor for any Miller's Creek locals moving towards Willow Creek tonight, certainly the killer. Lieutenant Eric nodded in agreement, but seemed conflicted, saying, our biggest issue isn't whether we can find him, but those ghostly haunts. Detective Ryan had never encountered the haunts before and wasn't afraid of ghosts. From Lieutenant Eric and Detective Kevin's accounts, he couldn't imagine the haunts horror and remained adamant. What's there to fear about haunts? We just have to follow Mr. Johnson's past advice. The three of us hide at the village gates without making any noise or going to help anyone in trouble. Just monitor for anyone abnormal leaving Miller's Creek towards Willow Creek, then immediately text to alert the others to move out together. If we strictly adhere to that, the haunts won't appear. Detective Kevin also agreed with Detective Ryan's deductions. It's very likely because last night we inadvertently spoke in Miller's Creek territory that we drew out that creature. Tonight, if we're more careful, there definitely shouldn't be any issues. Lieutenant Eric sighed deeply. He was very worried things would go badly like last night, but the deadline to report to superiors was nearing, plus the serial killer would act again tonight. If the three of them didn't intervene now, another innocent life would end in the killer's gruesome burning method. Finally, Lieutenant Eric nodded, agreeing to the plan Detective Ryan and Detective Kevin proposed. All right. Let's first synchronize actions like this. Tonight, the three of us must stake out the village gates, one per gate. The rule is while hiding, we can't make any noise, just carefully observe. Especially if we see someone in trouble, we absolutely can't be soft-hearted and attempt to help, understand. The other two praised Lieutenant Eric's idea. That night, following the plans, the three hid in bushes by the village gates. Detective Kevin took the west gate, Detective Ryan the south, Lieutenant Eric the north. When the last rays of dusk faded, they stealthily crawled into the bushes and stilled their breathing, straining not to make the slightest sound. As night fell, households throughout the village hurriedly went inside, locking gates and bolting doors tightly. Time ticked by silently. Sweat soaked Lieutenant Eric's shoulders as each second crept past. He desperately hoped his deduction this time would be right like before. The killer would emerge from the darkness so he could end the villain's reign of terror. At precisely 7 p.m., a black shadow lurked at the head of the village path. Lieutenant Eric tensed, holding his breath and willing the space to be dead silent. It seemed the only sound in the air was the vexing buzzing of mosquitoes. Sweat gradually slid down Lieutenant Eric's forehead, drenching his back more and more. He quietly reached towards the pistol at his hip. Then he silently waited for the black figure to approach. The shadowy male silhouette steadily advanced with perfectly even footsteps seemingly unaware he was being watched. The man glided past Lieutenant Eric's hiding spot. In the dim darkness, Lieutenant Eric couldn't make out his face. After the man moved some distance away, Lieutenant Eric carefully began tailing him closely. The black shadow kept walking slowly and lay surely at a constant, machine-like pace. 
Lieutenant Eric had to match that steady speed to trail him. Not too fast to be noticed, not too slow to lose sight. Amidst the tense tracking, Lieutenant Eric suddenly darted back behind a house cornering the village path. His phone vibrated, signaling an incoming message. Slightly surprised, he quickly pulled it out and read the text. It was from Detective Kevin. At Westgate, suspect spotted moving towards Willow Creek. Lieutenant Eric shuddered in shock. Since Detective Kevin said she'd discovered a suspect, who was the man Lieutenant Eric had been tailing until now? Who was this figure so brazenly walking the night village path? Lieutenant Eric carefully returned the phone to his pocket, then peeked out at the North Village exit path. The man still walked there, maintaining his steady pace leaving the village. Lieutenant Eric decided to keep following to confirm whether the man also aimed to go to Willow Creek. If so, it was very possible multiple killers were involved rather than a lone culprit. That would make this a much bigger case beyond the three of them. One man they could overpower with their combined strength. But against a group, they'd need backup, or risk the gang escaping through a slight mistake. While cautiously trailing the man, Lieutenant Eric kept glancing at his phone for more alerts. Detective Ryan at the South Gate also discovered someone, he'd certainly send a message. After a long while with no updates, Lieutenant Eric was certain the South remained uneventful. Just as he turned to continue tailing the man, the figure suddenly lumbered around facing Lieutenant Eric. He startled and quickly hid behind a tree. The man didn't proceed towards the village exit, but instead headed back the way he came. Lieutenant Eric worriedly guessed, had the man noticed it he was being followed? Lieutenant Derek cautiously observed from the tree. As the man turned, his visage gradually came into view. Lieutenant Eric scrutinized intensely. The closer the figure approached, the clearer his face became. Lieutenant Eric held his breath, willing himself perfectly still. At a certain distance, the man's entire countenance was visible in the dim light. Lieutenant Eric gasped, barely stopping himself from crying out. Unbelievable. Lieutenant Eric had been trailing this whole time was Mr. Johnson. Lieutenant Eric's eyes bulged wide, straining to pop out his pupils. His throat seemed to constrict, unable to breathe. Mr. Johnson's figure strode directly past him. When he neared Lieutenant Eric's hiding bush, he suddenly stopped for a long while. Stunned, Lieutenant Eric wondered, had Mr. Johnson noticed him? He fearfully questioned himself. But fortunately, Mr. Johnson resumed his rhythmic, machine-like footsteps without stopping. Gasping in terror, Lieutenant Eric wheezed for air to recover from the brush with death. Like clockwork, Mr. Johnson looped up and down the village path. Finally, Lieutenant Eric deduced that the deceased Mr. Johnson must have become a haunt roaming the village waiting to seize anyone careless. Lieutenant Eric texted Detective Kevin, asking if the suspect she mentioned had left Miller's Creek yet. If not, it could be another ghostly haunt. But Detective Kevin swiftly replied, affirming it was definitely the killer. She had personally witnessed him boarding the pickup truck hidden in an abandoned Riverside lot. Also, she could see the next victim in the truck bed. She had updated Detective Ryan on this. Lieutenant Eric lightly exhaled in relief always worried about Detective Kevin's safety. If she mistakenly tailed a haunt, it would complicate matters. Haunts being ghosts rendered martial arts useless against them. The killer was human, so police tactics could fully restrain him. After a while, longer comprehending Mr. Johnson's movement pattern, Lieutenant Eric stealthily slipped away to the rendezvous point with the others. Arriving there, he saw Detective Ryan and Detective Kevin already hiding. Lieutenant Eric carefully crawled to their position. Seeing him come late, Detective Ryan asked, Why are you so late? We've been waiting half an hour here. Lieutenant Eric sighed, wiping his drenched face. I just ran into Mr. Johnson. Hearing this, Detective Ryan and Detective Kevin's mouths gaped, ready to exclaim, before Lieutenant Eric urgently shushed them to stay quiet. Careful. Don't let the killer detect us again. 
They stifled their fright, refocusing on the killer in the truck bed. He seemed to be staring at the stars and constantly checking his watch. Meanwhile, he paced around the bed, sprinkling black soup dust in some bizarre ritual symbol. Next, he started dousing gasoline on the girl. Finished, he lit a cigarette to pass time until the fateful hour. At precisely 8.45 p.m., 15 minutes before his scheduled crime time, he donned a Catholic priest's vestments. Just as Lieutenant Eric previously deduced, this killer was likely a crazed Catholic Satanist. There were many churches around, so his Satanism possibly stemmed from hatred of Catholicism. Lieutenant Eric could see the soot dust traced a five-pointed star around the girl in the truck bed. That pentagram likely represented some symbol the killer thought would summon Satan. Unable to wait longer, this time Lieutenant Eric didn't wait to fire warning shots. He swiftly slipped behind foliage towards the truck. Likewise, Detective Kevin and Detective Ryan flanked the killer. At exactly 8.50 p.m., the killer lit his torch, ready to ignite the girl and perform his wicked ritual. In a flash, Lieutenant Eric emerged, beautifully kicking the torch from the killer's hand, then lunging to grab it. The killer panicked and struggled to flee, jumping from the truck bed. But Detective Kevin and Detective Ryan pounced, seizing him in a pincer move. His hands were cuffed behind his back. The three hastily ripped off the killer's face mask. They immediately cried out in shock. Unbelievably, the killer they desperately sought all this time was none other than Quentin Miller, the brawny, obedient militia volunteer Mr. Johnson had enlisted. From Quentin's confession, he was a priest of the satanic Catholic cult. His father's group had been active but was gradually destroyed a decade ago. As his father's descendant, Quentin had inherited the duty of continuing the satanic worship to attain the delusional goal of loyally serving the devil in the afterlife. Three months ago, after fully researching the cult's sacrificial rituals, Quentin began murdering girls. He admitted there were no girls in his village, so he had to hunt victims from the neighboring village. When asked why he wasn't afraid of the haunts, he said he was scared but had long known the haunts' patterns in the village and could safely commit his crimes at night. With the serial burning murders resolved, Detectives Ryan, Kevin, and Lieutenant Eric returned to Ohio. Lieutenant Eric publicly announced his relationship with Detective Kevin. They had a blissful wedding. Meanwhile, Detective Ryan was Eric's fare to New York three months later to assist investigations there. A new case dubbed the Fire Demon was opened in New York, continuing to pursue leads on killers related to Miller Creek's satanic cult so Detective Ryan had to find ways to provide support. Regarding the haunt legend haunting Miller's Creek, people continued circulating lore about this bizarre creature and village with no explanations found. No one could eliminate the persistent haunt's torment of this land. Until 20 years later, when a master monk from the National Buddhist Church held a mass exorcism ritual here, the haunt's harassment of Miller's Creek finally 